Friends, it is Wednesday, February 9, 2022, and uh, we have some interesting, uh, two short interesting passages today, one from Matthew 4, one from John 4. The Matthew 4 passage has a, has a dramatic context. It is the one-on-one battle or set of temptations that Jesus encountered with the evil one prior to the start of his public ministry. You may remember, in all the Gospels, we have this sequence where Jesus emerges out of obscurity. He's been working as a carpenter in his hometown, family business, and he decides to emerge in a dramatic messianic way as a healer and a teacher. And uh, the, the thing that gets this started is his baptism in the River Jordan. His cousin John the Baptist baptizes him Somewhat reluctantly, he knows that Jesus doesn't need any flaws to be uh, corrected. But Jesus is taking a humble path, identifying with us in our need and our brokenness and our sin. Uh, At the beginning of his ministry, of course, taking those things on to himself at the end of his ministry. But he wants to begin in this way by identifying with sinners and going into the muddy waters of the Jordan and being baptized. And so he is. And what happens immediately then before he starts to preach, teach, and heal is he has this one-on-one with the evil one. And uh, the first temptation there is the devil asks him after many days of of, uh, fasting in the wilderness, go ahead and turn those stones into bread. And Jesus says this, Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's a quote from Deuteronomy. In all three of the temptations, Jesus, by the way, responds with quotes from Deuteronomy. He, He doesn't you know, bring up a lightning flash or call forth an army of angels. He uses this humble route of turning to the Old Testament for words that will put the tempta- that will put the temptations of the evil one will reveal their characteristics, will kind of unmask them. And so um he is, Jesus is suggesting with his reply that, uh, that the scripture of God has a special power to it. And it's a power to nourish us. In John uh, chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, that's the famous chapter where Jesus meets the woman at the well. And what precedes that is the disciples realize they're out of provision, they have no food. It's lunchtime, the hottest time of the day, and they go off to get food in a nearby village. Jesus waits near this well in Samaria and meets this woman, has this long conversation with her, uh, drinks some water, but doesn't have any food. And when the disciples come back, they say to him, well, oh, we, got, we got lunch, you better eat right away. And Jesus says, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And that food is to do the will of his father. There is a, an energy for our spirits and ourselves that comes from uh, o- obeying God's word, not only hearing it, but embodying it. There is a strength that comes from this that's even physical. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly emotional and it's definitely spiritual. It's a wonderful thing to think about this analogy of, of physical food and spiritual food. And... I like it because there's a, there's a sensuousness to eating. There's flavors, there's smells, there's textures, and, and that's all part of the experience of having food. And at a really wonderful feast or a beautifully cooked meal where someone has spent time preparing it, you know, there are a lot of sensory experiences and we want to savor it. So different than a fast food experience where we're just cramming the food in and moving on. Uh, eating in our car or eating on the run. Uh, This is a different experience when we're feasting. Meditating on God's word is like feasting. It is where you allow your imagination to come into play and you engage your senses with God's word. You imagine yourself as characters in the story. Uh, you, you, You think about the emotions that are connected with what's going on in the scene. You treasure the words. You repeat the words to yourself and you, you perhaps memorize them so that the words become, it's internalized. The, 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 the truths become 
not abstract, but they become part of your own outlook, your mental furniture, how you look at things, how you feel about things. This is what it means to meditate on God's word. Uh, let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, help us not just to read, but to meditate, to savor, to explore, to rehearse, to memorize, to bring your word from our minds into our hearts so that our, 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 what we see in the world and how we feel about the world is shaped by uh, the words that you communicate to us. Help us to expect, as we read the Bible and meditate on it, that you will be addressing us individually in the midst of our own circumstances and our own questions and our own callings. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.